Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these videos and all the associated work, you can join the YouTube channel directly at even a dollar a month, or you could head over to patreon.com slash aksum, A-K-S-U-M. Today, our special guest is Dr. Michael Wingert. On an interesting aside, before I really started the philosophy of art and science, he came and gave a guest lecture and discussion to my live Bible study that uh, I usually didn't record, but that day we recorded because we knew it was going to be some uh, good content. And uh, you can find that somewhere probably on, on Vimeo and I think on my gum road. <laughs> it's, it's basically episode zero of the podcast. He is a Syriac Orthodox Christian, so we are in full Afro-Asiatic communion. He's a, a lover of Giz as, as well. And he teaches and instructs and educates at multiple institutes of higher learning, which we will get into, including his own, of which he's also the dean at. And uh, he's in, I think, maybe the one of the most important facts, sixth generation Californian. Welcome to the program. Thank you much. Yeah, um, you could probably find that episode behind a paywall, right? So if you're not <laughs> subscribing, uh, like you said, a dollar to ten dollars a month, it's not a big deal. Just jump on it. This is this is worthy content. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so we can start in a million different places, but let's uh, start in California because I feel like throughout the past year and a half, two years, it was I think June 2020 when we did our last bit together. California, for many, 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 many different reasons, I think mostly bad, has been in the news lately. So maybe we can wax poetic uh, a little bit about it. Could you tell us what it means? Because most of the people I meet are, you know, they're transplants to Los Angeles. So whenever I meet them, you know, they're, they're always from somewhere else and usually a different state. Very rarely do I meet a second generation Californian, let alone a sixth generation one. Um, and I assume it has something to do with gold. Yeah, buddy, it sure does. Um, yeah, no, my family came out during the gold rush. And um, my great made his first bit of money in gold. But then he used to he used those um, earnings to then mine the gold miners. And so he you know, basically set up a, a business that catered to their wants and needs, you know, and um, from there he um, he grew his empire by, you know, taking those proceeds and um, riding because, you know, in those days you didn't drive, you rode, mm -hmm. rode all the way down from Northern California to the Mexican border and herded cattle um, up across probably our old stomping grounds, definitely mine. You know, and, and through, um, um, you know, the mountains that are now about I-5, right? Or what we call in Southern Californian dialect, the five. <laughs> People don't know who, who are not from California. You can tell Northern Californians and Southern Californians, we're like, we are different. And we have different dialectical nuances, right? So in the South, you're going to refer to every freeway with a definite article. You're going to say the five, the 110, the 10, right? The 405. And you identify yourself if you walk, you step into the north and you say, oh, I'm going to take the 80. People, whoa, what are you talking about? <laughs> Maybe you need to go back where you came from, son. Like, what are you doing up here? So, um, yeah, man, I got a long history. And, you know, they ended up um, settling in San Francisco. And, um, you know, just uh, I, I don't know if helping to build the city is uh, a thing, but, you know, both him and his um, children, um, well, really his daughter, and then, um, you know, the who, people who became my great-great-grandfather and um, then my great-grandfather, they had a number of um, investments in the region and the area and owned several uh, buildings downtown, none of which are ours. Some are featured in films, and you can always say, oh, yeah, that's your grandpa's old building. And... Uh, we it's kind of it is the american story the american dreamish 
but you know, not all dreams are pleasant. And um, it, it's really a story of class mobility and taking a wagon train out from Missouri to come here and find success uh, across generations. And then my grandfather to be raised in the fruit of that success and effectively walk away from it all. He, um, he could have inherited his family's um, fortune, I suppose is a, the right term, uh, but instead, you know, he, he um, met a, a girl from Iowa, from Mason City, Iowa, and he um, ended up moving to far northern California, a, a part of California that we refer to as the state of Jefferson. <laughs> uh, I've seen states. the ballot. I've seen the ballot initiatives. Oh, yeah. You know, it started uh, pre-World War II. You know, this is wow. a 1941 thing. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, for those who don't know, the, the very far north of California and the southern part of Oregon formed their own state, but you have to have it ratified by Congress, so it's mm -hmm. never been recognized. I've heard some people say Western Nevada as well. <laughs> yeah, I think um, whatever the county is um, bordering, what is it, Modoc County, uh, may have crossed over into that. I, I'm, um, I'd have to look and see, but, you know, they especially back then, they were really neglected by the, um, the state governments in Salem and Sacramento. And so mm -hmm. their flag, there's two X's on it, has nothing to do with moonshine, right? It's two X's in a gold pan, <laughs> uh, you know, nothing to do with moonshine. It's just, it's the feeling of being double crossed. And so yeah. um, that neglect, you You know, it's volcanic. There's uh, several volcanoes up there. They're all dormant. Um, and, you know, what ended up happening is World War II broke out. And, um, you know, the feds came in and, and started making roads and, you know, some basic um, infrastructure that was necessary for the area. And, um, you know, start pulling copper out of the region and then, um, you know, drafted <laughs> all the all of the, the folks behind the state of Jefferson, maybe not all of them, but, you know, it, and it changed. Mm -hmm. the, it went dormant for a while until, you know, people had to um, endure, you know, um, maybe the past decade or so. And so um, he, he moved up there and uh, he found his bliss, you know, and, and to, to quote Joe Campbell, he found his bliss and um, gave up the life I walked away from it and um you know that I, I learned a lot from that because it takes you, you know i wasn't raised a christian or anything and um that was going to be my next question i was going to ask you what the religious tradition of of these folks was that's mixed you know they were um uh you know Rome, french roman catholic and jewish and you know whatever the uh, English side was. I mean, I'm, I'm really a, I'm mostly German and Italian. So like, there's a, a bunch of stuff going on in my, my heritage, mm -hmm. but, um, the, so, so there is, there's not like, it's not more Protestant or more Catholic. I, and the Jewish surprised me actually. No, I mean, it's, uh, I think those were inherited traditions mm -hmm. more than they were like walked faith yeah. for all of them, you know? And, um, I don't want to speak for other people, but it seems that when you acquire wealth, your your worldview changes, and that impacts how you encounter reality, right? Um, I, I know faithful, wealthy people, I mean, faithful billionaires even, um, but it's not, it so happens that I have also seen quite the opposite where you know you can be from a tradition but you're so focused and immersed in the world that you've created that whatever that tradition was that defined you is an ornament to your it may just be something and not even an ornament it may be an, an ornament in the in the shelves right on as part of your closet or you know your, your dresser or whatever and um, it may not be defining you like it would otherwise and so um, 
while I wasn't raised a Christian, I, I got these interesting lessons from my family, right? And my grandfather, especially, who, you know, he could have chosen the thing that a lot of people chase after. And the thing that started off that trajectory, you know, in his family's um, heritage. And, and quite honestly, his side goes back to 1608, um, landing at Jamestown there in the second wave. Mm -hmm. um, Jamestown was settled in 1607. And um, that would be know, the Church of England at that time. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's going, That's the mon monarchic history of America there. <laughs> got it. And, prior to the revolution. You know, the family ebbed and flowed with, you know, their resources and their opportunities and whatnot. And of course, I'm only talking about his side, but yeah, to be able to walk away because ultimately it, it asks the question, what is the price of happiness? What would you pay for happiness? What would you pay for peace? You know, and um, would you sell, you know, your buildings in the city? If you're on the East Coast, the city means San Francisco. It doesn't mean New York. Okay. So if you're from California and you say the city, it means San Francisco. Um, you know, would you sell those? Would you, you know, you know, things they had accrued and um, just go like live, you know, with God, you know, in the in in nature, you know, in the region and in the, those places that. Um, were less touched, you know, by human hands, you know, and instead naturally sculpted. And so um, go fish, go play golf, go be with your family and friends, work on a, I mean, he made, he bought a dairy and, uh, you know, went from, you know, some um, type of wealth and into this, you know, life of getting up at 4 a.m. every day and, um, you know, working your butt off and having, you know, like coming home, with cow manure under your fingernails and stuff, <laughs> just because you're out working, you know, hard every day. And he told me those were the happiest days of his life. And so um, I learned a lot. And I think what that did for me is it, it set certain things in motion for me. It it, it created a framework that you know um, what you know would bring you and I together, right? Like I was able to fit into the framework. I think maybe easier than some other people who, I, I don't know, they come from a completely different context and, and set of reasoning, um, you know, for how they encounter things like not just Christianity, but it's Eastern Christianity in particular, which is, you know, that's, that's the jive behind like, the philosophy of art and science, right? Like that, that is the propulsion. That is the... <laughs> and East of the East. That's right, right? <laughs> east of the East. So East of the Empire. Um, anyway, you know, I've, I've talked for a long time. No, yeah, that, so that's good. The reason I ask you that and, you know, we'll, we'll segue it to what did connect us. And, you know, we gave him a shout out last time. We'll give him another shout out, shout out to Orlando, the odd rocker, who I believe originally connected us, but, you know, we established our own friendship well right. after that for, for many years now. Um, and have collaborated a few interesting times, uh, in person and, and online, um, and over the phone to, for me, the interesting question that I've asked a number of people, and I would love to get your take on, you and I it, come from similar places. It's not the exact same place we come from. My parents were nominal Orthodox Christians who never in their life consistently went to church. And so the name of God was there, but like this sort of rigorous prayer life was not there. The prayer in my life was during high holidays and, and that's it, you know, and it was usually not them leading it. It was whatever, you know, old person was there. And it was more like um, an obligatory shout out to, to the, you know, respect some KBR for the, the older person in the room. I, I wonder if, you know, I'm always thinking of what's the best way to mass produce, if possible, people like you and I, and maybe the answer is just, there is no way to mass produce it. But the question, you know, you think of, and, and shout out to Malcolm Gladwell, who originally made me think of this, and Joe Rogan's made me think of this question too, that, that some level of hardship as well as non-religiosity in 
your upbringing and in mine led to our our form of rebellion like the death to the world folks right like the punk thing to do is to become afro-asiatic orthodox so you you eventually come from uh you said a, a more secular milieu but you became syriac orthodox christian that like i don't know how many people <laughs> can you count on a hand how many people have done that you know it, in it's your irregular generation? it's irregular i met a i met a young man um the other day who you know had a similar vibe he came into the coptic church as an atheist mm. um, but i think it's you know i know a ton of converts to the syriac church who but their stories are place um, a lot of them they they found their previous tradition um, either mildly lacking or entirely bankrupt right um, but those who journey from, you know, religion to a different expression of religion are sort of different than those who um, move from a, a different language, right? Yeah. To this language. And I, I say it that way because I don't want to say, you know, that um, I don't think, I think there are, are embedded religions in most things that we wouldn't even call religious. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like there's structure, there's rhythm, there's pattern of life, there's things that define how you live and um, how you act and whatever the principles are that unite you and other people. Maybe you gather, maybe you don't. But, you know, if it sets you in motion a certain way, that could be regarded, you know, as religion. And, you know, I mean defining religion has been a problem for scholars for a long time. So I think yeah, people, it's, people argue about it and people yeah. have joked, what's the difference between, you know, a cult and a religion. It's that the, the cult's leader is still alive and the religion's leader is not, you know, that that's like, it, it it's hard. It is hard. And I've seen, there's also like a technical use. I learned from reading like more academic stuff in my adulthood that people use cult like a technical term, you know? Yeah. I saw professor Ephraim Isaac, you know, talk about the cult of Mary and the cult of cross in Ethiopia. And I was like, I didn't like that word. You know, I, I like reacted because I wasn't taking it as the technical term, but I guess what I'm asking you is, and if it's too personal, you, you don't have to answer it, but in terms of like how you raise your kids, you know, do you then try to raise them in a pious way? And will that produce them being pious or will they rebel against that piety? Or do you try to raise them irreligiously the way you were raised? And then that's how you get them to rebel against the world on their own. That's a, honestly, that is one of the, I think, most useful questions I've heard when it comes to faith today. Um, and I do think if there were to, you know, you ask how to replicate it, like on a mass mm -hmm. scale or more than here and there, right? more than here <laughs> yeah. and there, I think that will, that's more than likely to happen now than 30 years ago or 50 years ago when religion in f whatever forms it existed was the norm. Now you have this major, uh, I don't want to call it evangelical, uh, like the evangelical atheist movement that doesn't make sense but like there's a that a makes sense yeah. like fundamentalists split right half stayed you know in certain christian traditions and half went atheist and they're doing the same thing just across different generations you know and that's i think it's laying the groundwork for opening up what like what drew you and me um you know to our respective traditions of the one tradition and that's the the lack of fear of dealing with truth i think you know like we're, there's no fear in addressing things that are problematic there's nothing to hide behind um there are you know two thousand years worth of conversation that okay maybe we don't talk about things like robotics and ai and, and things like that in the past but we talk about different frameworks that can then be applied to those conversations and we can find our seat at the table for those conversations. And I thought that was, in my case, um, really affirming and reaffirming the more I would read, you know, of our, our own ancient traditions. And so um, I think that's, you know, 
it's a fresh remedy. People call us the, you know, this hidden pearl, the, the Syriac tradition, but it extends to all the, the east of the east, right? You know, Orthodox Church. East side Syriac and west side Syriac? Both, that's right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, on that end, um, I think really it, it's about being able to, um, to f fill the belly, right? There's to fill the hunger because we need something legitimate and we don't need to go through motions. You went through motions in your earlier phase, as you described. Um, and then, you know, something happened that, that pulled you in deeper. And I think the, the hardest thing has been within these communities that we're a part of, there is a, um, there is a major disconnect between those who inherit what, you know, has been passed down to them from their ancestors, from their fathers and families and their mothers, right? Um, and really like being immersed in their own tradition. And even if they are, they're not always able to translate it across cultures. So if, if people come here from the old country, they may be very well versed in things, but maybe they like can't talk to the youth, you know, or they can't, you know, package it in a way that is meaningful to the youth. And when I say youth, I don't mean like five-year-olds. I mean people in college, right? People who are in the youth of their life. Usually they're they're not married yet. And they, I mean, if they are youth, they're not married. That's how we, we kick them out. Like you no longer go to youth meetings once you get married, right? They may bring you back to speak. <laughs> but, um, you know, like in the prime of their life, think about it that way. And with my own kids, I'm thinking, you know, I like, I need to do it the right way. I need, in other words, like I need to set them apart in a way that lets them grow and think and isn't afraid of whatever's out there. It's when, you know, people inherit a tradition and they don't necessarily for what it really is and instead engage its surface elements that I think that's the danger. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on it with my kids and what I'm trying to do is set a culture um, at home that, you know, that thinks in an, um, an orthodox way. And it, it thinks in a, um, in a way that, you know, could be considered generally Christian, but at the same time, uh, uniquely us, you, because, if I'm planting these seeds for, you know, who and what we are, a time will come where they, you know, can choose what to, like, what they want to pursue in terms of their own, the richness of their own heritage and tradition. And thank God, my, you know, my wife is, um, you know, a, I don't want to say a, a nationalist, a patriot, a um, purist, you know, like, what's the right term? But, you know, she, she comes from a family that values, you, you know, their heritage, their tradition. I mean, she grew up uh, overseas and, um, you know, they spoke Aramaic in the house and she didn't even learn Arabic until she was five, right? It'd be like if you were on a, a Native American reservation and they sent you to kindergarten, you know, with all the Ferengi, with all the, all the white kids. And then you got to start speaking English and, you know, you just used to Choctaw. <laughs> that's all you've been doing is Choctaw, you know, like that's kind of her, her deal. And so um, her family's, you know, like they, they value um, what they were given. And so I want to, uh, I want to share that in a way that, you know, um, lets my children give thanks. I don't want them to ride the, you know, into the realm of, of pride. I, I know people like to be proud of their heritage and stuff like that. But if they're and then they can tell some really, you know, interesting or fascinating facts about it, that's different than, you know, what was given living in them and they being the continuation of that thing. So um, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a challenge for our times. But right now, man, this is the this is the time that we're going to see. Um, 
we're going to see a more massive growth. And quite frankly, because the world is becoming smaller, um, we're seeing a major interest in it. You know, we, I don't know about you. I know I get contacted. I'm connected with people worldwide who are, they just never knew. They never knew. I mean, how many people, when you talk about like Africa's own heritage, you know, what do we have? We've got uh, some cultures on the Nile who were able to produce their own written language, you know, from, you know, the headwaters of the Nile and, and um, you know, going down the Nile, which is going north, right, into <laughs> Egypt and all these, That's these right. communities. Let them know. <laughs> you got you to gotta tell them the truth. <laughs> but My uh, class uh, at my elementary school that I work at, we made a, a T-shirt. And everyone's supposed to do things about nature. So everyone, a lot of them did animals. Some of them did trees. And I did the Nile River. And they had no idea, like, what it was. They kept asking me, like, what was that? And I made sure all the students know. It's an, it's an Ethiopian river that they let the <laughs> Egyptians have water from. Right? <laughs> the Mai. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Good Semitic word, right? Um, so it's... it's uh, it's a fascinating thing when, you know, you we have a certain view of a place or of a people or of a community or of a region, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, and there is instead this this richness that's encoded in the culture's own expression of itself, right? And Ethiopia is... I'm not sure how I pronounce it the the, the way I know how, which vocalizes the I <laughs> Yeah, so, say it again. Sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah so um, that's the more correct way, to be honest. Um, you know, Giz is predominantly preserved by Amharic speakers, but also by Tigrinya speakers, a minority. Yeah. And um, there are, I would say, more mistakes, quote unquote, in language, you know, prescriptive is descriptive, depending on what you are, uh, more mistakes from Tigrinya speakers like ki they turn to chi ki they turn to chi uh ga they turn to ja like gimel jimel um, yeah. they do a lot of those things um but the one thing that i think objectively they preserve better than the amharic speakers which is impressive because they're the minority is the ayn the Tigrinya speakers of Ethiopia and of Eritrea still use the Ain, and uh, my wife is Eritrean, and and she makes fun of me for my attempts because my attempts to like pronounce it sometimes I overpronounce it, and she like she does it so smoothly because it's so natural for her, but I don't. You know, and and that's how if you're trying to pronounce that letter, uh, anyone, you have to go hard, right? <laughs> Like you, it's like you get locked up and you got to go fight somebody the first day you're there, right? Kind of establish your ground, and whatnot, <laughs> and, you know, let them know that you're there. And uh, <laughs> that's what it's like fighting that guttural sound that, that's back here. I, and so I, uh, I've been doing that. Yeah. I, I picked up hard. Hebrew over make the it. pandemic. Um, oh, okay. I don't, you know, I'm no, I'm just a very basic student of it. And so I had to, you know, Hebrew also preserves it <laughs> to, yeah. between the Aleph and the and the Ain. I had to make an effort. And my teacher, I, I learned mostly on myself, but then I read for about six months with a teacher and he made sure that I pronounce it differently. He said, even even if it's not, you know, perfect, I need you to at least distinguish between them. They need to be different sounds that you're making. And, and I brought that practice back to my own Amharic, which is hilarious because it's lost in Amharic, but it, it's there in the alphabet. Yeah. It's tough with Hebrew. Um, Hebrew is dominated by people who don't speak Hebrew with that sound. Yeah. And many of them are Semites who grew up speaking Arabic as their first language. So um, it's a it's a it's it's an interesting question. You know, I, I teach Hebrew uh, among other languages. B and biblical or modern biblical yeah. and um in in that case what i do is i vocalize the letters the way i would syriac mm -hmm. syriac is another word for aramaic of a certain era um mostly from the 
environs of the town of Edessa in southeast Turkey, also called Urfa. And I do it that way for the purpose of probably whatever you were told, so that people who are starting to learn can um, figure out that certain sounds correspond to different letters. And it's, um, it's challenging when you learn and people pronounce them um, like Aleph and Ayn the same way. Mm -hmm. But the flip side to that is because that is now the, the major tradition. Um, language that's like Amharic, you know, or Tigrinya. Tigrinya is using Ch instead of Ka. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very common phonetic shift. And it happens in Arabic dialects. If you go to the Gulf and you, you hear people, um, you know, if you want to say uh, words with a K, sometimes they come out with a Ch, you know, and it's yeah. usually in contact with Persian areas that that happens, but it's normal. It's mm -hmm. normal. The, the word for uh, cherub is one that comes to mind. Amharic speakers say kirub, okay. and the Tigrinya speakers say chirub. That that is a a happy accident, isn't it? Right? <laughs> it is. Like, why do we say cherub? Because we we get this text with a, a ch sound, right? And that ch in English just happens to make a ch instead mm -hmm. of a ch sound. And um, anyway, it's funny that way. But all that to say, like language moves, people. Are dynamic like we're speakers of language and um even english right we don't go through anything we go through it <laughs> it's a drive it's a drive through not a drive t-h-r-u what the hell is that what word is that t-h-r-u well it's a word now a drive through <laughs> that's not through i want i want i want every letter pronounced even the g-h which is we don't do so much these days in English, but anyway, we're language nerds. So if you're not, into yeah, that, let's, watching, let's talk about you that. Will be. You will <laughs> well, be. Let's explain it to them because we've danced around a few Semitic tongues and we do say tongues rather than languages to mean languages in the Semitic tongues. And um, if you don't want to be an anti-Semite, then you have to say tongue instead of language. And well, uh, <laughs> how is it in Hebrew? <laughs> Uh, is it not Lashon? It's uh, Safa, the lip. Oh, the lip. Okay, nice. So, yeah. Pretty cool. No, nobody says the Lashon? Because I know that it's word. It would be same. irregular. Yeah. It would be irregular. I mean, it's um, in the same way that we use tongue in English, mm -hmm. right, to describe a language. The king's but, tongue, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And But what he's describing is Lashon or Lashono in the Syriac version. You know, it means tongue and language, like quite literally. So when you want to articulate, but I mean, what does language mean? Lingua, right? Sublingual uh, yeah. <laughs> under your, you know, like, so it's. It all goes back to that area. Languages and learning languages that you think you're like, wow, that is so insightful. You study all this, you know, these Semitic languages or whatever languages, and it's just fascinating the depth. And then you're like, what does that mean in English? Like, I actually don't know where that comes from in English. Then you're like, oh, wow, if I only knew English <laughs> better, I might like respect English a little more too. Um, you know, like, what's our, our Latin heritage, right? And, and what does that say about things like lingua, you know, and language and things like it, it, it It's tongue related, right? Yeah. It's, so we're playing with tongues everywhere. Um, but I think, you know, at least we've, uh, we've inherited a tradition where we're using latin words and so we're not thinking lingual because we reserve that word maybe for medical use of our tongues right or for um scientific use of that you know we, we're not going to say hey there's something on my lingua <laughs> like, oh, okay <laughs> can you let me see it <laughs> right no something on my tongue right uh, i bit my i bit my lingua so um you know english is it's packaged in a different way so we don't even like we're just disconnected whereas yeah. the semitic languages they're still connected you know and um anyway. so how how did you get into the study of semitic tongues and you know was it was aramaic the first one and you know you've already mentioned that there are at least two aramaics but i think there are a lot more 
and I've quoted you several times as calling it as the African Aramaic. So yeah, buddy. You know, <laughs> um, Aramaic was in the news, and you and I had a, a chat about that um, when President Trump was in office. People wanted to curse him while he caught the bug uh, in uh, Aramaic, and they messed up because I think Amharic was listed first because it's A M rather than A R. And they didn't know what Amharic was, so they thought it was Aramaic. And so they they had a lot of people cursing out Trump uh, using Google Translate in Amharic. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a whole spectacle that that then pissed a lot of Ethiopians off. And they said, you know, they didn't necessarily want to defend Trump, but they said, why are you doing all this demonic stuff? Because they had demonic imagery and, and they were literally using curses. In Google Translate and Amharic. So then a bunch of Ethiopians who are of the persuasion of complaining about cultural appropriation said Amharic was being culturally appropriated. And they used that to de then in, in a sense defend Trump, which was, it was a funny confluence of a lot of different things, but it was all aimed at Aramaic, which I assume was the first one you, you looked at, but um, correct the record there. Yeah, a couple of things to talk about there. I mean, for me, Aramaic was my first Semitic language. And when I say Aramaic, I mean the Syriac variety. So I acquired it when I, um, you know, became part of the church. And um, I, the liturgical language is primarily Aramaic, where it's rooted in Aramaic. Um, the tradition is Aramaic, Syriac, right? And, um, you know, I, I got good at it. And I was surpassing people who inherited that tradition. And so I mean, people, uh, you know, people I respected from the community, from the church, you know, really um, helped encourage me to, to pursue it to, um, more formally. And so from there, I, um, the next one was probably Hebrew. And, you know, I did some Arabic at the church, too, because people are from Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, etc., Holy Land. And um, so, you know. Okay, well, formally at least Hebrew, and then um, Akkadian, Ugaritic, you know, all of the standard academic, Phoenician, you know, languages that you would learn going through a Semitics program. Um, and then, you know, there's, for Syriac, there's two major accents, right? And those aren't. I don't even know if you want to call them dialects. You could just because it's the same language with a different pronunciation. Um, and that's Syriac. And Syriac is a certain style and period that came to dominate during the era where Christianity was growing and flourishing in the, in the Near East and beyond. And so, um, you know, there's ancient inscriptions that exhibit a lot of local dialectical quality. Um, of Aramaic. Some of those, you know, look a little more Canaanite. Things Canaanite is like Hebrew is part of that, mm -hmm. that branch. And um, other things look a little bit more Akkadian, which is more into Mesopotamia. Think, think Iraq, think Northern Iraq, think Assyria and Babylonia, places like that. Uh, and then, you know, you have the imperial period and what gets written down in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not just Hebrew, it's Hebrew and Aramaic, right? And so, um, that's a Persian period style, you know, and it's interesting. Um, so, and that one is, is it different than the classical Syriac that is spoken yeah. in the first few centuries? Yeah. I'm writing AD. a paper on it right now, actually. Yeah. I'm so it's, uh, they're, they're same, but different mm -hmm. sort of thing. And, you know, maybe for the, you know, the Ethiopian folks, it could be a matter of, um, I don't know, I mean, Amharic and Tigrinya. Uh, it could be a matter, you know, that maybe. I think that's even, Tigrinya. I think that's even farther, you know, Probably. different within Amharic, different regions. My grandmother's a great example. The word sun is Sahai. Some say Sahai and some say Ahai with a harsh T versus the TS. Mm -hmm. Um, I know something weird, the patriarch who's in communion in us, your patriarch, I believe we call him Mor, but we have Isaac the Syrian and we call him Mar. 
Mm-hmm. And that that's one of the examples of it, right? The the title is it mean lord or you know yeah, some sort of honorific lord master sir, yeah. And that's that's it. Mor and Mar. Which one are you going to use? Well, it depends what side of the river you're talking to people. Which side of the Euphrates? You know, and um, you go further east, it sounds like an all. You go further west, it sounds like an all. And eventually, I mean, at one point, there theoretically one sound, an all sound, right? A long A. We, you know, do the long A. Well, people do a, a variant of the short A, mar, right? Others do the, sounds more like an O, mor. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's moved in that direction. And that's like, it's a natural occurrence, right? With this all sound, a long A, it can go one way or another. Um, and, you know, if people condition their ears, they can understand the classical. Yes. Because it's the same language, you know. But that changes when you get into the modern stuff. Modern stuff is um, has several different iterations. Um, is that what they call Neo-Aramaic? Yeah, or we call that... Neo-Aramaic, right? right. And the Northeastern Neo-Aramaic style spoken by Christians and Jews is... Um, it tends to be Eastern. It's Eastern for the most part, meaning it's going to have an awe sound. And sometimes the dialects are um, intelligible and other times it's very hard unless you're skilled. Right. And so, you know, I'll watch my wife talk to people, Assyrians from Iran, and they're like, they don't understand, you know, and part of that is because, well, which set of foreign terms are you grabbing? Are you taking them from Persian or are you taking them from Turkish and Kurdish? Are you taking them from Arabic, right? And like, or do you just use a different, you know, set of vocabulary entirely, right? And so a simple modern Western Aramaic, um, Sulrite, versus modern Eastern Aramaic, um, Northeastern Neo-Aramaic, which we call Sureth, is, you could say, God bless you. They'll just choose different words to bless people with. And so for people... Who aren't used to it they may not think about it like you know aloha ambarech god bless you is western way or aloha natarach you know the westerners you know aloha torelo they have a similar so you know, it, it, i think i understood that the first one of is course. may he bless you and the second yeah. one is may he give it to you may he may he guard you guard you okay i thought it was like natan feel like it's what it's very priestly blessing right very numbers ish. You know, the Lord bless you and keep you. Yeah. Business. So one chooses one word, the other chooses the other word. So sometimes they both know Aramaic and they're both using Aramaic. But if people grow up using certain sets of vocabulary, others may be less familiar. I once got in trouble. I got to be quiet. I once got in trouble. I got into an argument with my mother in law because I used the proper Aramaic term for something. And she um, was <laughs> she was not conditioned to hearing that, so she interpreted it as the Arabic word. Oh, that was a mistake. So I got in trouble for three days, even though the rest of the family was like, "No, no, he's saying it this way, like it's like this village. It's you know, like, it's okay." <laughs> but you know, if you don't know what box to put it in, right, then. You know, what do you do with it? You got to figure it out based on what else you know. And so um, that's a problem these days because they're, in the old days, we can talk about a Syriac. We can talk about Imperial Aramaic, right? We can talk about stuff like this because we have um, either an empire or a literary authority, namely the church, that is putting out texts. And if you put out texts, you put out something common. You put out a standard, right? If you don't have those things for the purposes of... See, in in the history of Aramaic, for example, we'll have periods of standardization, and then, you know, someone else takes over, and it's localization. And then the dialects start showing up, the little local things. Presumably, right, like, you know, going back to California, there's a standard English, and then there's what people in LA say versus what people in NorCal say. Yeah, no, yeah. Hella, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, anyway, it's, uh, I just kind of went on a riff there, Kanye style, but... Um, yeah, no, so you and, got 
into the Aramaics and extended to the logical connected Semitic tongues of the of the Near East. I I wasn't sure actually. I didn't know quite uh, what was the chicken and what was the egg between joining the church and learning the languages. But I see it was joining the church first and then you know development of the lingua uh, later. So that's interesting. And at a certain point you weren't just a student of all of these tongues, but you began to be a teacher and uh, you've been teaching um, with different titles at, at different organizations. Now, where where are you teaching nowadays? Where, where can people take your classes nowadays? Well, I, I teach at a, a bunch of different places. Um, I used to teach at UCLA. I, I work on a project at UCLA still for the St. Catharines, um, you know, um, manuscript database project which basically processes these ancient manuscripts uh, from saint catharines of the sinai of egypt they have a fantastic yes. library um, i don't really teach there anymore but if they need me I'm, I'm happy to to teach i've been able to develop some great coursework for ucla actually um, that you know is my research interest and it's um uh something I, i'd love to do more frequently but you know, the opportunity has to arise. And in the meantime, my, uh, it's a newer Eastern Christian university. So, you know, we basically have um, scholars from every tradition of our family. We've got Ethiopian, Coptic, Syriac, uh, Armenian. Could you say and, the name again? I think it cut out a little. Sure, Agora, mm -hmm. Agora, um, like the ancient Agora, you know, of Alexandria, for example. And um, what's an agora, right? Like we use it in economics too. You know, we want to describe a market, right? Mm -hmm. a market economy or something like that. Well, it's that marketplace of ideas. It's where people went to figure things out, right? It's not TV. It's more like long form podcasting than, you know, the hit and run <laughs> television of, of mainstream TV. Like that doesn't fix anything. That's like a flash uh, of something, but you know, long form podcasting, you can work through issues, you can think about them, you can do a whole series just thinking about something. And, and the old marketplace was like that. That's where people met to have those conversations. And so, um, you know, we took that name for that very purpose. And it's really um, being a collection of Eastern Christian scholars, we needed uh, a platform for us to tell our own story and invite anyone else in. Because as you know, um, everyone else has told us who and what we are the whole time, right? And, and the whole time in the last 200 years, 300 years, like in the history of modern scholarship, um, you know, you can talk to Deacon Mahari a little bit more about this. He can riff longer than I can on that topic. Um, but, you know, we, we have a collection of everybody from our, our common family of traditions. We also work with Chalcedonian Greek Orthodox and uh, Byzantine Catholic people. And so that's the, that's the main place where I, I teach. I'm the dean um, right now of, of one of the colleges. And um, I also teach languages at Fuller Theological Seminary. I teach Biblical Aramaic and Akkadian, the language of the ancient Babylonians and Assyrians. Uh, it's a um, Eastern Orthodox program. I, I teach for their MDiv program. It's language stuff, right? So, um, you know, where... Uh, say where, that again. Sorry, it cut out a little. Yeah, so I, it was Hebrew for the Antiochian House of Studies. Yes. They're an Eastern Orthodox community. Um, and it's an MDiv. So, you know, where someone needs a language teacher who also knows the tradition and can, like, package it that way, that's kind of, you know, where I'm like, hey, come help us. <laughs> you know, yeah. or, Hey, you want to try this? We've got a whole new thing going on. So, you know, I, I'm I'm thankful for it, and I, like this year has been such a blessing because I got to teach Akkadian, Syriac at Agora, Biblical Aramaic at Fuller, and uh, Hebrew, you know, uh, with the Eastern Orthodox. And so, like, 2021, you know, while these years have been like not fun for a lot of people. For me, like at least this part of it has been fantastic. You know, it's um, really doing what you love. And so uh, maybe I'll, I'll teach some more obscure languages that I've studied 
in the future. Um, and we hope to, you know, we're aiming to have Gez, you know, formally taught at Agora um, at some point. And, um, you know, all the languages of our tradition, even the dialects, all the different Aramaic dialects and um, things like Coptic, which is uh, a form of ancient Egyptian, um, you know, classical Armenian, um, et cetera, et cetera. So Greek, you know, classical Greek. So. Yeah, it's very, it's very important. And I hope that in having conversations with scholars like you, I will inspire more people to study them. I always say we don't have enough people who know these languages. There, there are so few, um, especially this intersection that you occupy of a believer or one of the faithful, as well as someone who studies one of these languages, one of the kind of um, narrow idiocies of Daesh was going around and destroying historical evidence in the name of their warped view of Islam and, you know, uh, smashing idols. Can you speak to, you know, why would you, as a Syriac Orthodox Christian, have any interest in studying the history of these civilizations in the ancient Near East, which were, you know, all pagan with the exception of uh, the Hebrews, you know, all of their Semitic kin were all pagan. Um, the Giz history is a little more mysterious, and yet the more and more I look into it from biology and historical evidence, I have this weird sneaking suspicion that the Giz speakers were also, you know, some sort of pagans that then later found uh, Christianity as well. But but yeah, why why would you? What do you have to gain in studying pagan cultures? Well, the way I'd say it is this. And there's a really cool story um, that I learned from the Russians who, when they had first um, encountered Native Americans from Alaska, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't even the, the Russian Orthodox clergy. It was just their faithful fur trappers and people who were going across the Bering Sea and settling, you know, in uh, what was then Russian Alaska. And they they were the first missionaries but maybe not in the sense that we would think of today like a modern missionary they were just they were faithful christians who lived in and among new people and when they encountered those people they listened to their stories to their histories their folk tales and a number of those they were able to correlate with their own spiritual history in the common history of of uh, the imprint of a common human tradition. In other words, things we could call pagan, which, okay, that's one perspective to take. We can, we can say, we can make, take a dualistic approach and say, yes, no, X, Y, you know, good, bad, whatever, right? Like Christian, pagan, faithful, unfaithful, believer, non-believer, whatever. Or they can say human for us all. And what's the the separating i mean read the old testament how the old testament's full of um the the faith community the israelites being scolded for being pagan right mm -hmm. in not in, in in a manner committing of speaking. idolatry yeah yeah committing in idolatry a manner of speaking right yeah, yeah so you know you can look at a person who comes from a different tradition and see you know well what are the roots of that tradition and what are those things that are common to the human experience? And how does their history bring us closer together, right? Like, are we fundamentally different? Or, you know, are, are there common points of understanding that, um, you know what, we're, we're not different? And like, people could look at you and me and say, okay, you guys are different. I am more comfortable in an Ethiopian church than any other Orthodox church, you know, like, because we have so much in common, at not just the theological level of which we're the same, but in terms of expression, in terms of language, you know, your haimanut is my haimonutho, you know, like <laughs> it's, I feel very comfortable in, in the um, Tawahedo tradition. It's not a problem. And so looking at people like that um, over 
like not to, and, and that's a great example because they're they're sep the russians that is the european wet and they're for those who don't know and are watching the russians are part of the eastern orthodox community they're not necessarily connected with the oriental orthodox or east of the east right and you know and they're but we, we're we do we're very close you know in spite of whatever um things would otherwise you know make us not the same um we're very very close especially when compared to the rest of the landscape of christendom mm -hmm. and certainly so, de facto if not de jure yeah right and so in in alaska that's different people culture language and distance it's another continent right it's the new world it's the it's the back door but it's still the new world and you know in being with them and studying them they encountered you know the 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 human condition that was common to them though it was coded differently in accordance with whatever the tradition of those, the Alut, you know, the different communities mm -hmm. um, uh, later on the Tlingit and people like this. But if, if you want to, if you never knew this, like a lot of Native Americans from Alaska are Russian Orthodox because mm -hmm. of that history and tradition. And so for me, when I'm studying the ancient Near East or Egypt, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking at the foundations of the way that people like Ephraim and Afrahat and Jacob the Saruk and Philoxenos and all of these luminaries of the Syriac Christian tradition, who were their fathers? And how did those traditions condition them to express themselves as they did? The same way, you know, Justin Martyr, um, a father who, um, Justin Martyr, Justin the philosopher, known by several names, uh, first century Christian or second century, some, somewhere around 100 something, I don't know. Look back at someone like Socrates, you know, as laying the groundwork for Christianity. And within that entire landscape is a respect of what it means to be human and who is human. In other words, if we say, what does our tradition tell us? That the word human in Hebrew, at least, is Adam. Adam, we think, is some guy's name. Hey, Jerry, you know, and then God made Jerry and planted him in the garden. He made, you know, Bill and put him in the garden. Like Adam's not just a name. It, it, it's Adam is the human, right? And so if, if we all have this, if we take our narrative and we f we're feeling the narrative and we know that, you know, whatever we teach from the, the perspective of that narrative is that, you know, there is a commonality that we would call family, and it goes back to the human, and thus being human, right? So when I'm looking at the ancient Assyrians, I'm reading their mythology or the people from Ugarit, which is a city on the coast of ancient Syria. These would be, some people would call them Canaanites, others would not, and that's fair. Um, there's reasons for both. Uh, you know, they share so much in common with what it means to be human, even if they don't articulate themselves in the same canonical code, right? Like what we express in faith is a code, if you think about it that way. Other people are expressing themselves in a different way. Now, it's, it doesn't always align, but at least you understand people. Sometimes there is influence. Sometimes there is alignment. Sometimes whatever they're doing is what ancient Israel is critiquing specifically. And there's things that we didn't know until the last couple hundred years. Like we dug up these texts from the city of Ugarit and they, they gave us a peek into what Canaanite religion was like. So you start reading the Bible from the perspective of, oh, those are the guys they're talking about. <laughs> have a little heavier meaning because they're using similar language and it's rebutting things, you know? And so um, the same with the, the ancient Near East. Sometimes they lay the groundwork for the gospel. Other times they, um, you know, would be something quite different. 
you know, quite different. I mean, what did the ancient Assyrians do by making a policy to, so it, again, the ancient Assyrians, they were an Akkadian use people, right? They're writing in the Akkadian cuneiform for most of their operation. But as they grow and expand, they're the ones who start implementing the use of a Western dialect or a Western language. They're, you know, they're close, but not the same across their empire picked up by you know the babylonians and the persians and all of a sudden aramaic is the lingua franca now people who are divided by local languages and dialects are communicating in one language and that's why people wanted to go out and curse someone in aramaic because it was the language used at the time of christ and if you look in the new testament you see all these weird phrases pop up here and there hey please girl get up you know let it be opened, Jesus says, right? He's on the cross and he, he prays Psalm 22 from the Aramaic text saying, Eli, Eli, mashpaktani, right? He's speaking Aramaic. Aramaic had become the lingua franca at that period. And so there's this weight to it. There's this power to it. And then you start seeing movies and TV shows and um, people picking up Aramaic here and there and, and using it in like there was that one movie. I forget what it was. Was it Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ? Well that was an era like that was a I know the person who translated it. And it's that was a its own thing. And <laughs> uh, there's another one that came out before it was a nineties movie, some kind of curse thing. There's like Aramaic writing on the wall and whatever. Um, or on TV was Hell on Wheels. You ever see that show? No, I didn't. It was like, uh, you know, people who got lonely after, you know, Deadwood was awesome about 20 years ago or however long it was ago. And then uh, we had no real good Western until then. So they came out with Hell on Wheels, which is about the railroad and the cross-continental railroad connecting. And there's one kind of psychopath character in the, the show and he goes into chanting in tongues at one point. I don't think any, no one's talked about this online. So I don't know if anyone's caught it, but he's, he starts going, I'm and he's like doing fake sounds. And then he mixed in, you know, the Lord's prayer, Samayat, right? Like, yeah. right. And you hear him and I'm like, go oh, <laughs> take it easy. And um, anyway, so, like, I, I don't know, like the image of Aramaic in the West is this power language, this magic language, this um, like secret, you know, language or whatever. And maybe it's exotic and sexy. And, um, you know, that's the reason for, OK, well, we can't find Aramaic online in Google Translate because you know, we're all getting tortured out there if you hear that. Um, so let's go to Amharic, you know, and let's plug in Amharic instead. Man, that was a riff. Yeah. So. And would that be weird of them to choose Amharic? Because, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but you um, talk to us. Let me make it more open. Talk to us about how you first encountered Giz. And, you know, when did you start to realize, hey, this thing is not that different? Um, that's a good question. I first encountered it before I became a Christian. Wow. Um, and I won't give you that full story because it would take another couple hours, um, <laughs> maybe some other time. But... Um, I bought Wallace Budge's two-part text on hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. I was studying Japanese and ancient Greek at the time. That's what kind of language nerd I was in 1997. And uh, systems that had something to do with Egypt at some level or another. You know, things like Hebrew and Arabic, I've heard those before, right? Coptic and Syriac, I didn't know what they were. So I started mm -hmm. researching them and, you know, that, that opened the door to, oh, wow, they're Christians in this part of the world. Uh, but another alphabet, it wasn't an alphabet, it was a syllabary, right, was called Ethiopic. And that was my first encounter with Ethiopic. Um, Ethiopic, it sounds like Ethiopia. I have no idea what these things are. There's a bunch of different characters. Okay, it is what it is. <laughs> and so... Um, Long and you'd heard of Ethiopia, though, by in the oh, sure. you knew, everyone yeah. in the eighties heard of Ethiopia, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Growing up, you you know you would refer to the starving kids. 
because that mm -hmm. was the image projected of Ethiopia in uh, the U.S. at the time. And, Even um, into the 90s with South Park. I grew up yeah, right. getting the, the butt of those jokes. The, the Ethernopian. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it wasn't until, you know, I became more savvy in, in, in the faith, the different traditions, like the specifics of them, rather than the general uniting things that I started... You know, if you see a, a script you don't know, it's harder to access. But if you, if you instead um, get the transliteration or something. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that was weird. Um, if you get the transliteration of it, if you see it in the yeah, Latin because alphabet. then you can compare, right? Like the. Um, and maybe it was when I heard Bismillah wa wuld wa minfis kidus ahadu amalak amin. Like, okay, I understood everything. <laughs> so now I need to start paying more attention. This is a trip, right? Um, Xavier doesn't sound the same though. No. <laughs> so, you know, then you got to start hunting. But, you gotta start learning. but does the Xi part, is there any word that means Lord that's. Because uh, that, I think. Um, I could be wrong about this. I think it's related to the root for the word giz, which um, it has a few meanings. With the ayn, uh, and I've seen different scholars argue about this, but typically with the alef, it, it giz means strife or dispute. And with the ayn, it means first or free. And um, so I'm, 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 I kind of see the G and the Z there and wonder if our word igzi, which means Lord, has anything to do with liberation or freedom. For example, during the Paschal season, one of the calls, we we have a back and forth uh, call. You know, in the Greek tradition, it's like, you know, Christos anesti, alitos anesti, Christ is risen, truly he is risen. It, in ours, it's a longer. It seems like anything we get, whether we get it from Greek or Syria, we tend to extend it. I, I spoke with Jonathan Pajot recently and told him how we have uh, an extended version, maybe two to three times as long of the uh the the cherub and the the thief and that that play in the in the syriac tradition and maybe i'll have to translate the ethiopian version one day so people could uh, compare it to the aramaic version sounds but, like a paper <laughs> yeah that would that would be great one day but you know uh he freed adam or he liberated him. He he guzzed. It's like turning guzz into a verb. And I I wonder if like Lord means liberator or someone who who frees or or anything um, like that in any of the languages if you've ever come across. Because that that is a weird one that you say because you you've done a study on the word amlak and yeah. you tied it to melek for me. Uh, and that that connection ever blew my mind when you when you said that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, just on Amlak first, because the other one's harder for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so gotta... Yeah. Like, there's a beauty in, um, in the theology that's hidden in the language. And so um, the, that word meaning like the, it's related to an owner or a boss, mm -hmm. right? And that's how king is by extension comes from it. But if that's going to be like, if you're going to call someone that, if you're going to call someone like, what's the reality of that? Truly God is the only real king. And so your, your earthly ruler is your, you know, Negus. It's this taskmaster, same root, you know, functioning in Semitic, the guy with the whip. That's who the, the earthly king is. And um, the choice of those words in Ethiopic is, it's a signal. Again, it's like, you know, hearing language and lingua, and we don't think about the way Lashon will, Lisan maybe, in guys, mm -hmm. take us back to the, the tongue imagery, you know, the act of speaking. It's not writing. Writing is a secondary reality to how humans communicate. I mean, now we write and, and we send letters and things. And so it's become, it's, there's parody, right? But, you know, that, that beautiful thing about uh, uh, Ethiopic abounds with that sort of 
embedded theology in the word choice. Um, interestingly, the, the, the leader of Samoa, the islands of the South Pacific, he won't call himself the king, he calls himself the head of state because God mm. is the king. You know, and it's the same sort of thing, right? Like it's, um, but you only know that through the language. And if you just say, Amalak means God. Okay. What does that mean though? Like, what does it mean to be God? And so, yeah. um, I, I. And it's a verb to, too. It's a, it's a verb too. To rule, so, yeah. To rule or to reign over. So it'll say like, he made the, uh, I don't forget, in the, in the hymnography of the church, it'll say something like, he made the the sun to reign over the moon or something like that. And if you take it to just mean God, it's like he made the sun, God, the moon. And it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that, that, that won't work. No. <laughs> so it's so, to have dominion over or ownership, like you said. Yeah, perfect. I mean, um, so I think, you know, with, with Lord, number one, I don't know how it's spelled. Like, mm -hmm. um, Igzi this part from the first part of, you know, Lord of the land. Isn't that what Igzia Beher means? Yeah. The, the Beher is like nation and it's, um, it's even uh, entered the modern politics in Amharic because oh, okay. the regime from 91 to 2018 introduced this word Beher and said, Ethiopia is not a nation, but it's a nation of nations. Mm -hmm. And, and then it, it divided into divisions that had, it's never seen before in an attempt to slowly, you know, balkanize or Yugoslavize the, the country and saying that there is no Ethiopian identity, that there's only, it's like a, a loose, very loose confederacy, but that there's no national one. And it emphasized language as an ethnic identity. Interesting. And, and it divided the country up. And, and whereas earlier than 91, which I was born earlier than 91, you know, it would just be Amharic is written and then most other languages are just spoken languages. They began like writing everything down. And what it essentially did is it localized everybody so that if you were, you know, a rural kid from an area where it was Amharic was not, was, was stopped being taught and stopped being used like in many places you'd have a harder time getting to somewhere else and then you feel more distant than, than people um, elsewhere. But yeah, the, the exe part is um, Aleph Gemal. Um, I don't know the name for Z. <laughs> Z. And then, um, and then usually it's another Aleph. So maybe that's my own answer that it's, uh, it's wrong. <laughs> now, now, actually, I'm, I'm now that I'm thinking about it. There's a, a word that incorporates the two aleph rather than the ein. Like I said, the the, the third meaning of good is which is strife, and they have this this military position, abagais, which mm. is like the father of strife. He's he's oh. one, <laughs> he's one of the like it's one of the military positions, like one of the vanguard positions. Okay. And so I'm wondering if it means lord in that sense in a in as a military title but we don't have to get um bogged down in that so you you've looked at you know even ethiopic or as as we've said you looked at so many different programs and and you're involved with these different institutions um are there any particular classes you like to, obviously you want to fill the gap and fill the need whoever is gonna you know compensate you commensurately uh, but <laughs> are there any topics that you that, that spark your interest the most when when you're teaching or or that you think are the most critical for students to to learn and, you know to just be good people out there in in the world and the olam <laughs> well i mean um in no particular order i think every christian should learn syriac only for the purpose not to replace your language of prayer with Syriac, but to magnify whatever you already understand in the same way that learning Ethiopic, like if you really spend time with it, you know, and you have a conversation with the language that you're learning with Ethiopic, with Geriz, you're learning theology by learning language. So that's a perspective I think a lot of people you know, maybe aren't used to, 
And a lot of people have a habit when it comes to which I don't learn languages very well. And, um, guess what? You don't have to be perfect in a language to be functional. And even if you're not very functional, it's still really interesting to begin. So I think people put time limits on themselves and they think, oh, I'm taking this language, but I don't, I can't watch the news, you know, and therefore I don't speak the language. I don't, you know, I'm an A2 level or something, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm an A1 even, like I'm not very functional in it and they give up and it's, I would discourage giving up, right? I would say, try it. And if you're not perfect, welcome to the club. Like, just like the rest of us, you know? And if you uh, fall in love with something, you know, let it happen. Give it a try, especially Ethiopic or Syriac. Like, these are, they're very special um, in the world. And beyond that, I'm really, I'm interested in a couple things. One, and I'm writing a book on this right now. Hope, hope it gets out before Christmas. But um, I'm, I'm writing on the, the topic of um, divine inspiration. And I think that it's a core topic that's widely misunderstood and overlooked. And if we contemplate on it and spend, you know, we give it its proper time and attention that we can have new perspectives on, on reality. Like we can encounter reality in a better way than we do. We often, we don't think about, you know, how we define our own existence or define the world around us. We accept things. We accept other people's conversations, right? We join in a narrative or two or three that are being given to us, whether it's through mass media, social media, etc. cetera. Um, it may sh change the way in which we encounter others. And that's where something in the ulam is meaningful, right? Uh, beyond that, I really, uh, I'm into one of my major research interests is in healing theology mm -hmm. and theology as medicine. And um, when I spoke earlier about developing coursework at UCLA, I, I created a class for the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures um, in ancient medicine, really from the ancient Mesopotamian, that is Assyrian or Babylonian, and um, well, Sumerian, we'll bring them into, um, and ancient Egyptian perspectives. Later, it was revised a little bit so that um, it incorporated things like Greco-Roman medicine and, and Indian Chinese medicine as well, um, which are great and, and they're fascinating and old, but they, they, they're old in a different way. You know, when we look at Mesopotamia and Egypt, we're looking at really the uh, foundations of what we would call civilization. Some people don't like that word. Doesn't matter. It, civil, it refers to the civilis, the, the city. Right, like the idea of people no longer being on the outskirts, but mm -hmm. gathering in a way that they become functionally different as a species. Right, that's that's sort of the issue. And so, with that, you have the most ancient types of writing, right, that the world knows um, between Mesopotamia and Egypt and things like that. So, healing, um, trans, anything transformative that. Really, I mean, this is what you're asking. What makes us better? What helps us encounter the world better? Um, you know, Syriac, theolo Syriac Christian theology is specifically rooted in healing theology. Like, it is the core theme of the poets. You know, whether, and if you start reading poetry from that perspective, you realize, wow, there's a, there's a lot going What does that say to its intent? What does it say to the intent of the incarnation? What is the incarnation effectively restoring in terms of um, in terms of the image, you know, in which man was created? Right? Like how how does that moment of incarnation um, 
treat the quality of corruption as Athanasius talks about, right? It, it seeks to eliminate that quality and thus restore the image of man. And so like, that's all, um, that's all, if you're into fun, weird, funky stuff, Eastern things, maybe it's familiar to you. Maybe it's not like, that's the stuff I'm into. That's what I dig. Uh, a bunch of other things, but you, you know, prioritizing it, I do it that way. I like that. I like the, the medicine. Our word for savior is the same word for medicine in Namharic mm -hmm. and giz. It's madhin um, and madhanit. And I, I love madhanin, our savior, right? Yeah. yeah. There go. Our savior. There we go. See, get us this easy, guys. Just, just give it a shot. <laughs> it's French. You can do it. You can all do it. I'm not French, by the way. Yeah. You shouldn't call everyone French who's not Ethiopian. But anyway. uh, well, in as we would say, Nakid. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's even worse. <laughs> call me French. <laughs> that's so in Akkadian and uh, Aramaic. You know, um, like I'll tell my my daughters, Lim um, Don't speak to the strangers. Oh yeah. Don't talk to strangers. <laughs> that, that's all right. Then yeah. in Akkadian, it's not just stranger. It's like stranger or your enemy. The yes. You got to go whack, right? I just, I, I always think of the, um, there's a psalm that we chant. Um, send your arm from above. Adhidanni wa valhanni imai bazu. Save me and deliver me from the many waters. Uh, and from the um, the arms uh, of the little ones of the strangers. Wow. <laughs> this is one of the psalms that we that we chant. And so as a moniker for my Substack for a while, I don't I don't know if I still have it. I changed my name a lot on a lot of different things just to remain shifty to people. But I was calling myself like uh, you know, Mamhir or Malfono Nakir because mm. I think it's you know it's it's funny that I'm such a proud uh, Agazi or Giz man uh, or free man, one of the free folk, being born and raised in the diaspora. And, and the same way that you said, you know, you call yourself a Ferengi who's learned these languages. I always feel that you know my parents would insult me in many different ways, and I this is how I learned insults as a kid. But the one that stung the most is when they would call me Ferengi. And uh, or foreigner, you know, or Frenchman. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> so, so my my motive uh, of my ill intent, internal motivation of learning all these Semitic languages, but particularly Amharic and Giz, is so that I could be more Ethiopian than my parents, and uh, to a point where it's undeniable. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I passed my mom in Amharic. I haven't passed my dad uh, in Amharic, but I have passed him in in Giz uh, uh, tenfold. So sometimes he'll read thick Amharic books. Um, like he read this one by this guy called Bilatin Keta Mersi Hazen or uh, youth lord uh, Mersi Hazen, the forgetter of his sorrows uh, for his parents who named him that. And uh, this is one of the seminal uh, crossover church. It's a church guy. So he's got this church education, but he had an official position in, in the monarchy, in the regime of Emperor Haile Selassie. And he wrote this history of Ethiopia for the early 20th century. And so my dad kept quoting all this Giz stuff to me. And, uh, you know, of course, he's not pronouncing any of the Giz correctly. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this word and I know this word. And, and so it was one kind of fun moment we share. He's usually uninterested in, in the Giz. Uh, yeah. But actually, uh, his mother, my grandmother, uh, fell asleep with the Lord a couple years ago, and I'm gonna have to uh, digitize this now. But I have this real manuscript, and this manuscript is my ninth ancestor, his eighth ancestors, uh, Psalms of David compilation that also has the Marian praise attributed to Ephraim the Syrian. It's wow. a very simple prayer book. It's several hundred years old, written on, on goat skin, and I'm I'm gonna have to you know catalog catalog this for the culture. But it's very interesting. 
uh, God bless my my grandmother, my father's mother, she willed it to me. And, uh, you know, she has seven kids. She didn't will it to any of her seven kids who are all alive and all, yeah. you know, ranging from their 40s to their 60s. She decided to will it to me. And, you know, it's uh, it, it, it happens sometime that way. So I, you know, I, I want to be, uh, as you are the most Syriac without being Syriac by blood, you are the most Syriac through the, uh, the blood of the covenant rather than the water of the womb. I, I have the, uh, the blood of the covenant and the water of the womb, but I don't have the land. I'm not associated. I wasn't born in the land. I'm, I'm born in, in diaspora, but, uh, I do strive through this channel and, and other means, uh, hopefully future publications as, as well to, <laughs> represent <laughs> and shame others into representing too. <laughs> use the use of shame is is underused in America. So oh, we got you should you should see these you should see these uh, these older uh, folks from church, right? They're like, you go talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> You're the guy. He is doing it. You are not. What is wrong with you? Type thing. How do they get pissed? The the no, no, the people, Syriac youth when they when they're like, oh, Doctor Mike. <laughs> no, I mean some of them, you know, it, there's a range of interests. Some get inspired and they get motivated, and um, you know, others think it's cool, and others be like, wow, isn't it a shame that he knows all this and we don't? And I go, I remember telling people, yeah, hey, I'll, you know, I'll teach you whatever I learned. They go, yeah. What time's the Laker game on? And they just immediately change the conversation. At that, yeah. you know, that was that was a while ago. That you know, that was a while ago when the Lakers were rolling with Phil Jackson when that happened. <laughs> but um, but yet yeah, you you know, um, let's let's wrap up by making a hard pitch for Agora, which we mentioned earlier. But can you talk about? the idea for people to understand a seminary versus a theological college and then the undergraduate opportunities that you all are also offering up because it is my firm belief and i don't know how anyone else could look at it other i have no sympathy or pity or even empathy towards any other viewpoint we have to build our own institutions and this is something you and i have thought of a lot i have my eyes more on k to eight and particularly third grade to eighth grade, but you know life does not end there. Um, we need scholars, and so I don't think higher learning is for absolutely everybody. But I think a lot of people, a lot of people, could benefit from it. And you and I are both beneficiaries. I only got a master's degree. You went a little farther than me, um, but you know, talk to us. You know, is it just for PhDs or people trying to be priests, or who who is the target audience? for Agora, and, and let's hope we could recruit some students through this episode. Well, <clears throat> I think we've been, some people who may have felt threatened by us. I know I, I could speak of some names specifically, but I'll do that for a more scandalous episode um, when I'm ready to throw down, which I will. Um, but we're, we're not a seminary. And I, I don't even know that we're a theological college. Mm -hmm. We are instead, we are the seeds of a, like you said, our own institution. And you don't just plop down out of nowhere and start a university out of nothing with, um, without major, major resources, right? Whether it's in buildings, whether it's in, um, staff and the ability to care for those staff and to employ, um, you know, your back end staff, your faculty, um, that takes a lot of work and it has to start somewhere. And a, a number of us who were from different traditions of our common, uh, Orthodox family, that is to say the Syrian, Coptic, Ethiopian, Armenian, etc. tradition, um, we got together and formed a, a cohort, you could say, a um, collegium of fellows, and people had asked us to come talk, you know, to their homes or to their uh, their college clubs and things, because they were getting one story 
in their university system. They were getting a different story in church and they could not, there was no meeting place for the conversation, but they knew we were trained. You know, I was working at UCLA at the time and others were working in different places or studying in different places. And so we were able to translate effectively the theology for the questions coming from the opposite end. And so our goal then is to create a legit university um, and not just a university in the um, the mainline sense or if you finish high it, it is that marketplace it, like we want to create thinkers who go out into the world and make a, a serious impact on the world you know what else are we doing this for some people are gifted toward the priesthood and you know what a priest needs to care about somebody if you don't care about people and love people, you may want to rethink the calling to priesthood. That's the bottom line. Like you are the one dispensing sacraments to a community and moving them toward communion with God. Like that's your, your leader in, in that. But not everyone's called to that. And people have different gifts. Some are musicians, right? Like some are gifted in terms of music. Others are gifted in terms of their, their work and they can then help um, fund people like they can share you know what the fruit of their talents right whatever they were given um in order to make a, a better life on earth for everyone others are teachers and for us we know what we're good at and we um, have created this endeavor around some of our core strengths right so a lot of the stuff i do isn't just theology but like okay i'll teach scripture classes i'll teach language classes that are related to the church but i also teach way beyond that too and so i don't i can't just start doing that out of nothing the other scholars involved they don't do that out of nothing it starts somewhere and so we've put a couple programs together that are theologically minded pro they're really programs in eastern christian studies so it's um it's not prepping anyone for priesthood although i think we have about 15 monks from different traditions who've studied with us, you know, like, I mean, take the extreme end, we have monks and we have regular lay folks, men and women, you know, we encourage our women to study with us. It's like some of the most brilliant students we have are, um, you know, women from the old country, you know? And so we have a, a great mix of people and we're doing awesome and bloom and grow. And over the, you know, it may take 20 years, it may take, time um but you know i have the next phase of expansion ready and i have a i've got a a posse of ethiopian scholars like who are ready to jump like they're fired up you know and, and ready to jump on board i've got you know a, a great um, collection of really people from all our different traditions who are excited about this because they know the direction it's moving and we we don't just want to be educators we want to engage you know like I will bring the marketplace to you, you know, and let's have those conversations. Let's talk about anything. I'm a theologically minded person. I, I encounter reality through that lens and that um, supersedes any other different type of interpretation that pe that may be prevalent in any period, you know, um, in recent years. So I think what we're doing is just as much a movement as it is a place to learn. And what we've, the feedback we get from our students, and you know, we've graduated a few cohorts now, um, is that the greatest thing that we've been able to do was to create this learning in a specific type of community that they don't really get access to. And it truly is unique. And, and it's honestly, it's the future of effective education. I mean, I, 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 and we'll do a whole episode on this if you want. I'm a firm believer that the, the traditional system is sinking. It's a sinking ship, you know, and it's, um, it's not, it's, it's not been like booming it's and it's ripe for a bust. Yes, exactly. And so um, call this an alternative, but we're, we are the inheritors of the ancient school of Alexandria, the ancient school of Edessa, right? of you know all of our our major traditions like we are the ones who founded
is our own tradition. And so we are the legacy of that. We are that, that tradition now. And that's another one of the things I love about, um, you know, the, whether it's the Ethiopian, Syriac, Coptic, you know, any of our churches, is that we don't perceive an outside history. Instead, we partake in a living history that those stories you read about that progress through time, they stop right now where we are and they're being written right now. And someday they will continue on and people will read about us and what we're doing. Like, what are you doing to shape this world into the kingdom? Like, how are you making life better for anyone, right? Anyone as an Adam who's created in the image and likeness of God, who different than you or same as you, you know, is someone you have a fundamental relationship with based on, you know, the narratives that we're rooted in. And so um, I think this, this institution, um, this endeavor, it, it's very much in line with all of these thoughts and this trajectory. And it, that's why I, I would call it a movement just as much as I call it an institution. Well said, and we will be plugging that in the description so that people could find your online presence as well. Are there any other, uh, you know, I've prodded you along and guided you along. You've worried about riffing, but this whole program is a program of uh, riffing and finding the nuggets of wisdom within the riffing. Any last words, whether they be your own or Ephraim's or... Uh, the gentleman, I, I butcher his name, of Mabug uh, or yes, Jacob of Sarug. Philoxenos. <laughs> Philoxenos. I, I, I would think I was saying like Philoxenos or something. Philoxenos. <laughs> hey, why not? Who who cares? Like, pronounce it hard. Thank <laughs> you for, for having me. And I think, um, you know, you, you did your viewers a, a favor because this is probably one of our shortest conversations on record. <laughs> um, you know, like several times we'd be in an eight hour phone call and be like, you know what? We should have hit record a couple hours ago. And, uh, there's and just sometimes so much. it's better that we didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, those are for, those are behind the paywall, right? So, um, uh, I would leave this is one of my favorite quotes from Philoxenus of Mabu. He's a father of the Syriac church. Um, and we haven't really talked about, I don't know if you've talked about the word anathema before. You know, I haven't, but I, I do. I love it a lot. I've, I've seen it in biblical translations because sometimes they transliterate that Greek word and sometimes they translate it as accursed. Yeah, it's like, you know, they translate it like accursed or they translate it like excommunicated or, you know, kicked out, something like that. Um, you don't want it, right? And so he's living in this age of people throwing anathemas at each other and whatnot. And, he finishes one of his letters with, um, let he who loves not the Lord be anathema. And it, it, why I like it is because it's, if people are focused on some other highly specific topic, which may be a valid conversation, I'm not diminishing any of those conversations, but then they lose the root, you know, and bringing it all back, right? Like, why is now a time? We've got all of these fantastic trappings and things on the outside, these forms, but what's the substance that drives those forms and makes them worth anything, you know? And if we're not really geared toward loving our fellow man, you know, we're lost. And so if, if I can't even do that, I can't then have that conversation about the super conversations are, I got to start from somewhere. So that, that hits me. And that's my, my quote for you and uh, everybody. <laughs>